formed by the kinds of stories you will hear in the next hour. And as I say in any cross-disability forum, people with lived experience of acquired brain injury represent the most disparate and diverse of any disability type. So Brain Injury Australia, in essence, represents everyone, regardless of age or external cause of their brain injury, from the shaken baby through to the old person who falls over and lands on their head in residential aged care and all points and all causes in between. So this, to me, is the highlight of my three days, to be capping it by chairing this particular session, starting with Jessica. Please welcome Jessica Birch. I'm going to jump straight in, so hello everyone and thank you for your time. As many of you well know, every second of every day our brains are buzzing with signals. Electrical messages traversing a vast network, directing all our major systems. Cardiovascular, digestive, endocrine, sensory, nervous and so much more. Oh. Apart from the brain's structure and neurology, it also controls the complex processes needed for the development of our motor skills, language, academic achievement, adaptive and executive functioning, emotional regulation, memory and cognition. Over the last eight years, these are just some of the things that I've come to learn about what the brain does and how it works. And what I realised is how little I actually knew but also how much I took my brain's functioning for granted, as I suspect most of us do. It's just kind of chugging along in the background, doing its thing, and most of the time we don't think much about it. Truly though, our brains are remarkable. Every single thing that you do think and feel, basically everything you experience, is a direct result of how your brain interprets the, in interprets the information coming from your environment. What I didn't realise is how altered or varied these interpretations can be depending on how your brain is functioning and how deeply this can impact your view and how you interact with the world. Had I or the people around me understood this earlier in my life, I could have avoided a great deal of pain and hardship because growing up, I certainly didn't think about what my brain did for me or consider that it actually might be letting the team down. My name is Jessica. I am 36 years old, and at 33 years of age, I was diagnosed with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, or FASD, which is an umbrella term for a lifelong developmental brain injury impacting my entire body. You may be surprised to learn that FASD is the leading cause of non-genetic disability in Australia. FASD is four times more common than attention deficit disorder, autism spectrum disorder and cerebral palsy combined. Yet despite this staggering statistic, FASD is so misunderstood and underdiagnosed that it remains largely hidden. Despite trying very hard to navigate life's challenges, um, such as my relationships, schoolwork, jobs, travel, my personal goals, and the rest, um, it, became early, it became obvious from a very early age that many things were harder for me. As I grew, everyone just seemed increasingly and inexplicably better than me at everything. <laughs> and I noticed that takes a toll especially when you desire to, work, to do well and are consistently told that you are smart, capable, and should probably just try a little harder. The fact is, I couldn't try any harder. And despite all my efforts and the expectations that I could and should do well, my results often disappointed me and fell below the expectations of others. A person with FASD will have significant neurological impairments in at least three out of ten identified brain domains, which results in an uneven neuropsychological profile. These differences cause functional difficulties across a variety of areas, and they manifest largely as behavioural symptoms. So, what that basically means is that when you live with FASD, it can be much harder, sometimes impossible, to do 
retain or even gain certain skills that are commonly taken for granted and integral to successfully understand and navigate the world. Things like remembering what you've learnt, problem solving, decision making, multitasking, cause and effect reasoning, understanding and following instructions, prioritising tasks, time and money management, uh, understanding and responding to social cues, forming friendships, the list goes on and on. The skills that we need daily to participate in society can be incredibly difficult to master and use. And without a good grasp of these things, everyday life can and does become an endless maze of barriers, mistakes and confusion. So I live in Melbourne. I'm a bona fide coffee snob right here. <laughs> and I make my own coffee. Uh, I, you know, grind the beans, extract the coffee, steam the milk, you know how it goes. And I do those things perfectly well until my housemate comes in to chit-chat. Now, don't get me wrong, I am down for a yarn, but now I have to choose. I can either listen, respond, uh, listen, process and respond to my housemate, or I can action the multiple steps to make the coffee. My brain cannot do both. If I attempt both, things become fraught. I'm instantly slow and flustered. Sometimes I just get straight up angry. Um, I think I usually do perfectly well is now prone to error. I stop and start, I forget the order I'm working in and I will forget what I just did and redo the step that I had done. My housemate becomes difficult to hear and understand. I can only respond in delayed, confused and disjointed sentences. My brain is now working quite hard to do something that most would consider quite simple. And I inv invite you for a moment to consider what the impact would be if you extrapolate not being able to talk and do at the same time. I certainly didn't think that how I was engaging in and experiencing the world was a result of brain damage. I really thought that everyone was experiencing things the way that I did. They just did it better, understood it faster or simply just had more talent. The effort involved in trying to keep up with my peers was immense and I failed often. I became increasingly anxious. I believed that my perceived failures were totally and unequivocally within my control and ultimately my fault. I was four years old when I began internalising these feelings as my own lack and it wreaked havoc on my self-esteem and completely eroded my self-worth. By the time I entered my 20s, I lived in anxiety, depression and despair. I hated myself and I often wished for my death. Attempting to move into an adult world with adult responsibilities was the hardest decade of my life. The neurological differences of FASD express themselves in a myriad of combinations. It is a spectrum, meaning that people living with this brain injury have their own strengths that can hide and can hide and mask significant weaknesses. Throughout my life, my high expressive language continues to hide significant difficulties that I have with auditory and sensory processing, memory, attention, emotional regulation, and my executive and adaptive function. Not to mention the many symptoms that arise due to the damage to my nervous system. It was largely assumed that if I spoke well, I could do everything else well too. Don't be fooled. I needed a range of support and months of preparation to be here speaking with you today. And I regularly engage in therapies to, uh, to support my functioning. And it is likely that I will need that support forever, for the rest of my life. Our brains are extremely vulnerable to alcohol when forming. I'm going to run out of time. Uh, despite, <laughs> despite common misconceptions, the fact is true throughout the entire pregnancy. There is no safe limit of alcohol exposure for, develop, for a developing fetus at any time. And even low level exposure is widely misunderstood and can be significant. Yet people remain largely unaware. As a consequence, the difficulties that arise for individuals with FASD are often blamed on the individual. And that leaves literally hundreds of thousands of Australians unsupported and often punished as a result of their hidden brain injury. Today we see an alarming overrepresentation of FASD in our welfare and justice systems. 
we must understand that there are many reasons why a baby may be exposed to alcohol in the womb, most often. As was the case with my exposure, a woman consumes alcohol when she is unaware of her pregnancy. Although my mother abstained the moment that she was, became aware of my presence, the building blocks of my brain and body were already irrevocably altered. This is more common than people realise, as around half of all Australian pregnancies are unplanned. Now, I would be remiss at this point if I didn't dispel firmly the notion that a woman would willingly or knowingly harm her baby in this way. This is simply not the case. And the stigma only serves to keep FASD hidden and confuse the truth, which is FASD occurs wherever alcohol is consumed and it does not discriminate between culture, education or socioeconomic groups. My journey to diagnosis took 33 years, not because I didn't know that I had been exposed to alcohol. My mother shared my birth story with me as a child. I knew, but it took 33 years because not one of the dozens of health professionals I saw either made the connection or had the courage to discuss prenatal alcohol-related brain damage with me or my mother. I have spent endless hours pondering, reflecting, arguing and crying over the impacts of FASD in my life, trying to come to terms and to make peace with the loss of all that I had hoped to achieve, the loss of my potential, my autonomy, the pain, frustration and shame that has polluted and forever changed my life experience drives me forward and compels me to speak. Not only to minimise, to unmask and minimise this hidden epidemic, but to communicate the significant damage caused by its lack of recognition in my life and the lives of others. How is it that despite over 50 years of research and millions affected worldwide, that we know and talk so little about it. Why is it that FASD is so poorly recognised? Nearly finished. Well, there are many reasons, but I have found two things to be irrefutable. One, we are part of a society where the consumption of alcohol is rampantly and, dare I say, insidiously marketed as a valued, if not essential, component of virtually all our cultural rites of passage. From birth to graduation, marriage to death, alcohol is ever-present as a celebratory tool and where all must participate to be seen to embody these notions. The alcohol industry makes a staggering profit from these messages and we see time and time again that profit motives too often beget undue pressure and influence. Individuals consume alcohol without being certain of contraception. However, if an individual is not certain of contraception, then they must be aware of consumption. Why there is such little awareness is number two. Simply because people are misinformed. There remains a harmful and inaccurate undercurrent of misinformation driving a message that FASD only occurs with excessive drinking or dependency. You've probably heard some of this. It sounds like, oh, a little bit is fine. Oh, my doctor said I could have a couple, but, you know, not too often. Oh, my sister had a few, and her kids are great. Or, it's okay in the early stages. Or conversely, it's okay in the late, sta sta late stages of pregnancy. None of this is true. This misinformation drives stigma and blame, othering individuals and communities and shaming people into silence. The impact of this, not only on women and families, but society as a whole, is beyond what most can comfortably comprehend. In order to change this and minimise the destructive force of FASD, we must remove stigma and blame. Understand that if we create safe and supportive spaces for the conversation about the issues, we drive awareness, prevention and change. Instead of blaming and shaming, let's inform and empower. Diagnosis saved my life. Understanding and support has given me opportunity. My self-loathing and despair has turned into a newfound appreciation for what I have achieved and a hope for my future that never existed before. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. That was brilliant. Please welcome Mark Thompson.
in my I would like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the elders past and present. Good afternoon. My name is Mark Thompson and this is my story. At the age of 35, I was doing what I loved, racing yachts. I was bringing a yacht back from Tasmania to Victoria. The worst thing that ever happened to me in Bass Strait the yacht rolled over and I was trapped underneath the yacht for 14 minutes. The crew dived underneath the yacht to cut the harness free and two rescue boats were sent out and a helicopter. From there, the helicopter airlifted me to a hospital where I remained in a coma on life support for three weeks. Whilst in a coma, I experienced a strange occurrence. I felt myself in a cone of light. I was sucked towards a pinpoint and I felt quite, com quite completely re relaxed and at ease. I could look through the pinpoint and more than anything, I wanted to enter through the pinpoint. But then suddenly, I was pulled backwards. My parents at this, at this point were advised to switch off the light support system. But they said, no, he's a fighter as a result of the drowning. I acquired an ABI and I awoke from a coma with Lance Adams syndrome and ABI. When I awoke from the coma, I was in a veggie state and I could not look after myself nor could I understand what was happening. I also had a series with trust and only felt secure with only one nurse. Imagine yourself a 35-year-old baby who could not walk, feed, communicate, talk, toilet myself. I could not do anything for myself. I had to rely on my parents feeding me or I would have gone hungry many times. The very first thing I can remember is being pushed to the rehab centre and being put, put on the straightening rack and there's only one word for this and it was bloody painful. I can also be remembered out in Bass Strait as it was a very cold place and I was pulled out of the water in the fetal position. Many months later, I remained in the hospital in the fetal position and I was, that's why I was taken to the rehab centre and put on the straightening rack to try and straighten my back. I had no way to communicate or express how I was feeling and started to write with the pencil every day. Then speech therapy and I'd learnt to speak again. Then I'd learnt how to type on a computer. I'd learnt a new skill. Then I was at the point of suicidal with the understanding I was not eligible for insurance. Also, my partner had left with my infant son and I was very lucky I had a matron that come by and she would take time out once she had finished her daily um, shifts and she would chat with me. Then it was time to work on my sensory skills. I did not know what was hard, what was soft, what was hot, what was cold what shapes fitted into what shapes. And then it was time to, to start to 
um, learn some life basic skills such as cooking, gardening and woodwork as I was building a toy truck for my son as this was going to be my new life. My next port of call was a nursing home. Here I was given another 12 months of physio, parallel bars and gym. Being here had its own set of challenges. At the age of 37, I was put here amongst the elderly and dementia patients. It was pretty damn annoying as I was always stealing stuff out of your own room. That way you thought you had dementia then. No matter what sort of therapies I was given, I did that plus more. Never give up was my motto. Later on, I went home to my parents' place and I could remember I would walk one hour the length of our driveway to a little statue boy that was about 20 metres away that reminded me of my son. Throughout the seven years, I broke seven hospital beds due to my clonic jerks and Lance Adams syndrome and moved from one hospital bed to another. I remain today on a cocktail of medications to control my body functions. I got back into the water with the help of my family to conquer the fear of my drowning. I was able to get back into sailing into a one-man yacht and achieve the Disabled Sailor of the Year in 2000 and year. In the second last destination is where the fun began. I can now use a walking frame or a wheelchair and then I used to do the grog run for the old people and the, um, do the grog run and their cigarettes. I could now shower, dress and feed myself. Also got my driver's licence back whilst in a nursing home. Finally, it was time to start with someone to work on my mental health. Then came the day when I finally had to prove to the matron I could now move back to my own home. Ramps, rail and a modified bathroom were all fitted out at my own expense. I'm now 63 and live a full life with the help of my daily carers. I'm now on a few boards as well in running a few community groups. Some of the daily challenges I faced while in a nursing home and aged care was sexual relationships and difficulties associated with privacy if my parents weren't available, I'd even eat my food, even off the floor. Li lying in my own feces for hours, living with people that had dementia, being put with people that had dementia when people had no place, when there are no beds available, no facilities for people available under 50. I brought a brain along to show you the damage caused as a result of the drowning that occurred. If I take the brain apart, the brown, the brown part is the matter that's shrunken um, as a matter of the, the shrunken by half and, and the, the base of the brain is so delicate just here. It affects my balance. That's why I'm doing my presentation off a chair and table. Nick said, that's my time up. Uh, pardon? Uh, none? 
So that should be on. No, you, you said. No, no. I timed it for the time you asked. Back together. <laughs> no pressure, Dominic. Hi, I'm Dominic. The beautiful boy beside me is Captain. My story began 10 years ago along the Dalmatian coast. It was to be a European adventure, sailing from Dubrovnik onto Turkey and across the Atlantic, exploring the coastline, meeting new people, understanding different cultures and eagerly tasting amazing food. I would even learn to sail. As I was accompanying a family from Sydney as a tutor to their children, and a deckhand during a year of sailing. As it turned out, I never learnt how to sail, but I did acquire some life's lessons from a rather memorable Albanian muscle. We were one of the first Western recreational vessels to enter the industrial Albanian port of Jurez, a commercial harbour very similar to Port Butney. We were in a 40-foot yacht docked between two container ships, as we disembarked for a much-deserved lunch, after an overnight sail, we dodged multiple cranes, forklifts and vehicles as the ships unloaded freight and grain. At the recommendation of some fellow sailors who were wedged on the other side of the container ships, we sat down at an upmarket re seafood restaurant. Complimentary mussels were served. The next day, we continued our sail onto Greece. It started as a journey of self-discovery but I lost myself and contact with my loved ones in a 32-hour ferry ride from Venice to Greece. I was young, sick and alone in a foreign country, presenting a rapid exacerbation of neurological symptoms over a matter of days with no diagnosis. I thought I would die in that strange and isolating hospital, which I later learnt was in Petras in rural Greece. The horror of those first days and the subsequent four weeks in an Athens hospital was my introduction to autoimmune encephalitis. Over the past 10 years, it has changed the course of my life. My diagnosis with a rare form of autoimmune encephalitis was the beginning of a saga. I have navigated my way through seven acute episodes of encephalitis since 2012 and it has taught me that being a medical anomaly involves many difficulties. A brain injury changes your conscious state and therefore shifts your perspective and understanding of the world. I try to see it as life with a new lens. These are my three life lessons, ones that I now use as a framework for life with an acquired brain injury. Firstly, discover your anchor point and lock it in your mind. Since my first acute episode in 2012, it has been important to have a clearly defined timeline with an end point during each relapse, an anchor point set to bring the mind back whenever it drifts too far. Settling an overstimulated mind is challenging. Settling an overstimulated mind with severe neurological inflammation in the frontal and temporal lobes of the brain brought on by encephalitis can be near impossible. An anchor point establishes clear parameters for the brain and mind. It is a point of clarity and certainty 
when the world seems completely foreign and you are overwhelmed by confusion, stress and unknowns. During each episode, my anchor point may shift depending on context and circumstances, giving me a point of reference when I haven't slept for weeks and have lost cognitive function. It helps me focus on the present. Importantly, I never drift all the way back to the hospital ward of Petras in 2012, but I remain present with a known anchor. Here's an image of my first relapse in 2015, sitting with my brother at Royal North Shore, when all I want is home, my family was always the comforting vision of calmness to lessen the residual effects of permanence. My most recent episode took place in April 2019. It was my fourth acute episode in less than two years, and I consider it the worst period of my life, and one I wasn't sure I could survive. But I kept returning to my anchor point. It was the one certainty in my life. My new anchor is a new vision of home, enjoying a sunset dinner with my family and my new friend. Over time, my anchor has become a greater tangible force than the chronic nature of my condition. It helped settle the panic, gave me a sense of security, and helped to motivate me. It has been over three years since my last acute episode, and if I were to get sick, I would fix once again to my anchor point. How to smile. It is difficult to know when you are through the worst of a brain injury or whether you've experienced its lowest point. The prolonged severity of any brain injury complicates the journey of recovery. A smile, even when you feel you have nothing to smile about, is a powerful antidote to the self-driven and non-systematic path of brain recovery. The transition from brain injury patient to survivor is arduous, unstable, and isolating. But a smile can lighten the burden of injured perspective during this transient period. Here's a younger and slightly nervous Dom, because from nowhere, huge winds had erupted, whipping around the boat, waves crashed against the stern, below deck took on water, we adjusted, strapped in, and sailed to the Corinth Canal. Since that passage, I have learned when there is no path, smile, find enjoyment, and capture the momentum of your self-discovery. It will become the beginnings of a meaningful life. Thirdly, learn to sail. I set out on a journey with the goal of learning to sail as a crew member of an Atlantic crossing. Instead, I've learned to sail the fluctuations of a brain injury, crossing a new ocean with a new crew of specialists, family and friends. Along the way, I've discovered raw emotions, complex moods, highs built on the waves of hope and unbearable lows in the face of another acute storm. Extremes of emotion and fatigue add volatility to everyday life. Even planning a routine is difficult. I've been propelled into an un ocean of un complete unknowns and forced to navigate my way in volatile weather. And years of being left at sea left me extremely isolated. I felt alone without direction. Here I am working as a deckhand, doing my best to master the clove hitch knot, which is a crossing knot that self-secures, often a sailor's best friend in extreme elements. I had my first relapse in 2015, three years after my first episode. Since then, I have more frequent and more severe episodes, with four episodes between December 2017 and April 2019. Each acute episode means weeks in hospital with severe loss of cognitive processing and memory gaps. My condition had become so unstable with inadequate time for recovery between each episode that I forgot how to sail the fluctuations of my condition. It has taken lived experience on deck with the rope in my hands and wind in my face to learn my best response along the curve of conscious competency. After a number of horrific years, I felt like a hostage to my illness, to its uncertainties and instabilities. I found myself without my anchor, without a smile, struggling to find purpose in life outside of my illness. I had lost the ability to believe there would be days ahead of easy sailing. Just when I had nearly lost all hope, a new enthusiastic crew member came aboard. Captain, a two-year-old black Labrador retriever, a qualified therapy dog. Captain has been the friend and help I didn't know I needed. I was determined to find a way through, 
but I couldn't continue alone. Immediately we were in sync and behaviours associated with longevity became instinctive. Captain is always by my side, eager for walks and swims and through his enthusiasm, I am finding more of a routine and purpose. Each day he brings his energetic smile, his thumping table and bounding joy for life. Together, we can climb mountains and he has been instrumental in changing the tides. It hasn't been all smooth sailing. I still get overwhelmed by everyday life, but with Captain by my side, I have more good days than ever before. Our bond encourages the dynamic participation that when we achieve together, we utilize the infinite capacity of the mind to overcome an undefined impairment within a confined space. Brain injury creates alienation. All you can do is your best to navigate each wave, each storm, enjoy the good days, and remember one small change can break that separation. It is difficult to quantify and communicate the initial damage and consequences of a brain injury. It is even harder to quantify and communicate its impacts years after the initial episode. Whatever the severity of the injury, it marks a monumental shift in a person's life, a shift that creates a seemingly insurmountable gap to life before and life after. There is still a gap between what I can do and what I want to do. Living my life with the knowledge of these three lessons makes everyday life more enjoyable and gives me hope that one day this gap will begin to fade. Here I am, a lefty playing golf right-handed with a black lab as a caddy. I can appreciate the uniqueness of my circumstances. I see it as an opportunity to create new enjoyment. I know more about my brain, its function and its limitations. I now know, despite all of my desperation, there is no straightforward how-to for brain injuries. This is my brain, sharing the lessons of my lived experience with Captain, partners two minds, to creatively find enjoyment, enabling me to see my best self. Once we are in active pursuit of our best self, we are no longer sick, survivors, or societal outsiders. We are being human. Thank you. Good afternoon. Life for me changed dramatically twice. The first was the 23rd of July, 1990, when my mother, a ballet teacher, died of a ruptured aneurysm. She was 51. The second was on the 12th of March, 2016, when I suffered one. I was 52. There was no warning on either occasion, just the heartbeat that ruptured the aneurysm. On the second occasion, my life became the polar opposite of what it had been. I lost my business, my livelihood and the essence of me. I now have a brain injury. I use a lot of analogies so family, friends and ho hopefully have a better understanding of how different my world is now. Because I look okay, the changes aren't obvious. I describe my memory as fairy floss. Because when you're eating fairy floss, it's there, it's tangible. But when you put it on your tongue, it just goes f and it's gone. Sometimes you can pull in little threads, but the right threads don't always go with the right stories. So that's fun at times. And the other analogy I use, a bigger one, to explain my ruptured aneurysm, is the day my brain did an unauthorised update. Imagine my brain as a smartphone, same cover, but the inside is totally different. It's lost a lot of the old features that I really liked. 
It's now got a really crap camera. Speakers are horrendous. If more than one app is open at a time, everything just goes to Turkish. Apps just close down or are missing. The battery leaks only holds a 2% charge. Best just to turn it off, put it in a dark room for a few hours before trying again. And then, with a bit of luck, right weather conditions, you might get a few good hours out of it. Sadly, it's the processor and can't be restored to factory set settings. For those of you who don't know, a brain aneurysm is a cerebral vascular condition in which there's a weakness in the wall of the artery that causes ballooning. Um, and a rupture of this ballooning does the results in a cerebral hemorrhage and that's what does the damage. Blood, even though it's the life force, really needs to stick to its lane. Once it goes out of its lane, it's not great. Apart from being one of the lucky 5% to survive a ruptured aneurysm, I'm also lucky to have retained my curiosity and my stubbornness. And that's, I'm positive, is what's helped me. That, along with my community, living by the sea, is how I'm still here. But it's also sent me on a mission to raise awareness around brain aneurysms, as at least one in 50 will have a brain aneurysm in their lifetime, the majority undetected or found by accident. Brain aneurysm ruptures are preventable, which means preventable brain injury and preventable death. Unfortunately, screening in Australia is not an accepted practice as it is in the United States or the United Kingdom. Nobody ever said to me or my other family members in the past 30 years since my mother died, get checked, as it's genetic in 90% of cases. There's such a lack of screening in Australia. When pressing doctors on this issue as to why, they've told me they don't want to scare people, as aneurysms are known as a ticking time bomb, as the first symptom is often the last, they don't want to expose people to too many x-rays. It's not sexy to research. The mortality rate is too high. None of these excuses sit well with me. Surely prevention is the best form of medicine? I personally think the brain's the sexiest part of the body. And as for x-rays and scans, I've had so many since I probably glow in the dark. Awareness, education and clinical pathways in hospitals are desperately needed, as one in four people will be misdiagnosed, as I was. Even though it was the one time in my life I've actually fitted into a square box, I was misdiagnosed. I now know I ticked all the boxes of having the classic symptoms of a ruptured aneurysm. Sudden onset headache. Worst headache of your life, slurred speech, difficulty walking, left side deficit, nausea, losing consciousness, stiffness up the back of my neck and a family history. I had all of these. But because there's no clinical pathways in hospitals for aneurysms and I'd been at a music festival, the emergency department at my local hospital assumed I was either drunk or on drugs, even though the person that was with me told them I was on neither. They treated me for a migraine for six hours. Thank goodness there was a change of shift and a new nurse that came on realised I was in real trouble and then all hell broke loose. And as we know, time's critical in preventing brain injury. Every 18 minutes, Think about it, 18 minutes and aneurysm ruptures and 50% of these people die within minutes. It's a staggering amount for something we don't hear very much about. There's no national campaigns, there's no television ads, there's no posters in doctor's offices. 
the Royal, the Brain Aneurysm Foundation for Australia website from the Royal Melbourne Hospital. It's been under construction for five years. Even speaking to the former Federal Regional Minister for Health, Dr David Gillespie, who is my local member on how to raise awareness for brain aneurysms, was extremely disappointing. In our discussion, he said to me, you'll never be able to raise awareness needed. You're just an ordinary person. Did you buy a lottery ticket when you survived? Aneurysms in the brain can be quite nasty. This left me absolutely stunned and proved to me again that aneurysm patients just slip through the cracks. The best and most reliable support and in information I've found has been from the Brain Aneurysm Foundation in the United States. I'm so glad I've found them. We are so lacking in any support and peer-to-peer -peer information in Australia. With the help of the NDIS and two amazing people, one of who's here today, I've started two podcasts. The first is Brain Injury Conversations. And because I didn't want aneurysms to get lost in that one, brain aneurysm conversations, to give a voice to survivors, listen to their stories, and to raise awareness around both. And just for people to hear, this happens to me, try this, this might help. And for family and friends to hear the stories. As for rupture prevention in Australia, we need Australian statistics, better awareness, screening, knowing your family history and clinical pathways in hospitals. With these small steps, major improvements can be made in saving lives, preventing brain injury, just as we've seen in other areas as heart disease and stroke. It's a fundamental human healthcare gap that needs to be rectified. If you know to ask the question due to prevalence and family history, it can be as simple as two words, get checked. Thank you. Thank you. Um, of all the sessions today, this is the one that's run on time, which only goes to show that you can trust people with lived experience to follow instructions. <laughs> um, there is time for questions. Closing remarks, whatever the hell that means, is happening in a couple of minutes, but any questions from the audience for any of our speakers? I certainly have got plenty um, and happy to ask them, but if I'd rather defer to the audience. Any members of Dominic's fan club got a question for Dominic? No? You know the story? Backwards, frontwards, sideways? Then I've got a question for Dominic. Actually, for Dominic and for Cynthia, too, in a way. Um, in some ways, it's a simple one, which is uh, I have lived experience of brain injury myself. Very, very simple thing to understand and describe, a bicycle accident. And people, all you've got to, all you've got to do is say that and people know intuitively what that means. I'm just wondering whether you get sick and tired of telling a story. No. no by, by which I mean when people say, what happened to you? explaining it to them so they understand. Is that something you get that you get frustrated in having to do time and time again? No, because it's Because of the lack of awareness too, because in some of ways. The yeah. lack of the awareness and it's the one story and it's the one story I remember. Right. Oh I see. Because <laughs> I've said it so many times. And it always brings up the interesting conversation because when I say it and I say I had a ruptured brain aneurysm, people inevitably go, Oh, that happened to my mother or my best friend or and it just proves to me again the lack of awareness and you right. just don't hear about it. So right. no, I never get sick about it. I'm not sure whether you heard my question, <laughs> Dominic, but um, I'm just wondering and given the relative obscurity of what happened to you, when people ask you when they meet you and you explain why, for example, you have a companion animal, do you get sick and tired of having to explain what autoimmune encephalitis is? Um, I don't get sick of explaining the illness if people are genuinely interested. Right. I get sick of defending my condition. Defending... I get sick of explaining it's my impairments and, and defending that. Um, I, 
I kind of wish I could just say I have a brain injury and I live with a chronic condition and that would be enough, but it very rarely is. So what does is, what is, what is defence sound uh, like? So what kinds of... Uh, um, what's, what's the stupidest question that you've been asked? Um, I guess... Um, or it, 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 is that still going on or is that still a thing? Um, How can that be? Yeah, How those right? those sort of things. And I guess when you say something's long-term or chronic, in everyone that spoke here today, they sort of have accepted that it's something they've got for life. Um, but when you're talking to friends even or general population, um, they probably think a year or two years. I mean, you have to repeat the same story. <laughs> yeah. um, that's, that's the difficult part. Right. And I guess the other, the, a related question is, as you say, Captain is your anchor. Is that right? Yeah, de most definitely. So I imagine you do get questions over and over again about why the hell do you need a dog? Y yes. Where's your cane? <laughs> right? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, that's, that's probably true. Um, um, Captain does so much for me, I think, um, in terms of, he, he even has had his eye contact on me all, all this session, but he, he gets me out into the world and I don't mind the questions about Captain. Um, where I live, um, my whole world has changed very different, um, from just having a dog. And we're in Roselle and we walk up and down the street and everyone knows Captain. Right. And everyone knows me because of Captain. Right. So it's a very different conversation now. So, and, and I'm happy to have those conversations. Um, one of the eccentricities of public surveys is that, and you've no doubt heard this, people are more scared of public speaking than they are of death in some cases. I just want to say that I don't know what went into today for all four of you, but I know an extraordinary amount of effort and courage was involved. And I wanted to thank you on behalf of the conference and this audience here. Please thank the speakers. And a small token of Brain Injury Australia's thanks and esteem, chocolates. You can't go past chocolates. Starting with Mark. Thank you. I assume you're here for the concluding remarks. Please thank the our speakers again. Thank you. This will be painlessly short, believe me. Uh, I do want to thank... This has been, <laughs> as you all know, this has been a long time coming. I was just thinking my first contact and correspondence with Dominique, with Jessica, with Cheryl, with Mark goes back to 2019, is that right? And then everything else happened. But firstly, I wanted to thank the presenters here today, plus the 80 plus speakers to the conference and the pre-conference workshops for their incredible patience and forbearance in sticking it out in saying, yes, I'm happy for you to postpone it again. Yes, these new dates suit me, etc., etc. So thank you for that. To Interpoint Events, the conference producers, particularly to Simon, to Claire, to Kirsten, and also to Johanna, who have been here for the last few days, who do an enormous amount of engineering and personnel management <laughs> to get us to where we are today. Um, to members of my board, Leanne, Roger Chung, uh, Natalie Foley, who all helped chair sessions over the last few days. I could name each and every one of the sponsors. One of the extraordinary things about this conference, this particular conference, is how well supported it was by the sector. And I don't take that for granted for a minute. 
as I said in my remarks to the openings of both days, if there's stuff that you didn't like about the last three days, please come and tell me. I'm a pretty straight up person. I've got pretty good defences. I've got a thick skin. You can say almost anything. And if you, if, you, if you did like the last three days, even better, please tell somebody else. Simon, Claire and I are in the earliest stages of planning for the ninth National Brain Injury Conference, which, as I think you already know, will be held in Adelaide in the second half of 2024, proudly supported by the Government of South Australia. So on that note... I thank you all again for attending, for your support for the conference, your patience with me and with the conference organising committee, and I look forward to seeing as many as possible of you again in Adelaide in 2024. Thank you. Hang on. <laughs> no, no, people have got planes to catch. Planes to catch. Planes. Hands up. Planes. Come on. Um. We know each other. Is this still on? Okay. Someone didn't let me speak this morning. Yeah, I know you didn't. Because I wanted to say a short question. And he didn't, Nick didn't want me to, to, to speak. And. Oh. Thank you. Um, it's taken me. 12 years to get, get here, Nick, yeah, and the and you always to get me, to help me down here with air days, you know, stuff like that. I'm all, if, shit, I'm coming in 2024. Yeah, I'm on the top of the list. I'm also, I'm someone who's born at the neurological birth defect with, you know, the shores of corpus callosum, but I knew died Twice in my first three months of life, because I didn't move. I was born a black black baby. Didn't move twelve hours after, because I had to be with the cord about three on my neck. And then that three months of age, and they died from cut death. And I'm still here. I don't know why, but I know again. I got a few comments to say you're here for a re reason. It's, yeah, what reason? Still, I'm still t trying to break ground and. I couldn't really, you know, met. another part of my story is I didn't know nothing about my neurological birth defect. Why I shit at school. I went through school, kindy, preschool, high school. I even did tape course. They didn't give me anywhere after school. You know, it was child care, but I thought I was just trying to do something. But, yeah, well, I didn't, that didn't really help. But it was only until 16 years ago when I had a major car, car accident. That was so with even though I was born with brain damage originally, I had a um frontal lobe head injuries, bleeding of the of the of my right side of my brain, so many days in the coma, facial fractures, six all nearly up six six and a half weeks in town to hospital. I'm probably the only one from far north Queensland that's here. Yes. Do you well? You really want to know? Well, Nick, I came because I wanted to get here for the last twelve years. But when I knew the um, Charlie Tio was coming, it was more or less him that I I came down for. But also, but also, could you come up here for a minute? Come on. I could do what I did yesterday. I did actually, I did do it partly yesterday. Even though someone, I don't know where she's here. She told me I'm, I, I, I'm funny and I'm a bit of a comedian, but thank you. Maybe I was, I'm using you guys as a test dummy because there's not many people with acquired brains who do actually do these things, do they? Do you know? Okay, that's scary. I actually thought about that a couple of weeks ago. I was like, yeah, 
you know. I like your, we haven't seen each other since when? Um, Cairns, with um, Cairns. No. It was 12, it was at least over 12 years ago when um, Simon, when Jan, JC did a, um, that, there's Cairns have those not many brain injury form, and Nick was one of the people that came up to Cairns at this um, two day event. Now, do you remember? Yeah, I do. Yes, yes. Okay. Sometimes you have some, you know, like I have to remind a few people how, how we met. How, since we met, how far have I grown? How far have I. You've grown a great deal, but I still haven't. Because I'm born into the world with acquired brain injury and I know there's, there's lots of different types of acquired brain injury. Even though I was born with rare genetic brain disorders, two, two rare genetic brain disorders, before I was actually born, before the umbilical cord was wrapped around my neck, it was going to suffocate me to die, but I didn't die. Because I want to become a public speaker. I want to get myself out there. I want to, even though I'm making it, I can't work in general terms like ScoMo was saying all this year about, you know, if you don't, if you get, if you don't have a go, you get a go. But I, I get no, as you know, I still, I don't have no income. I don't get the DSP due to reasons. Yeah, fucking thank you. I am married with three kids. And... Even even that is a job in the heart. But hey, guess what? I better not say it. My baby's turning 21 this year. I'm like, guess I got my own way. Someone did say that today. Okay, well, I've been trying to get there, so I hope you all enjoy the conference. I hope you enjoy me ramping and raving and yeah. So I, have, but, I, have, I have one, one very important thank you that I completely forgot, and I wouldn't be able, to, I wouldn't escape this auditorium alive if I didn't thank the extraordinary AV people who put this entire thing together. <laughs> We, t we, talk, we talk about invisible disability. These are the invisible workhorses who do an extraordinary job in putting all the PowerPoints together, making sure microphones work. And given the complexities around COVID-19, people doing things via Zoom, pre-recording and so on and so forth, it's like a four and a half somersault with Pike off the high board, what these guys do each and every day. So please thank our AV people. Oh, right. Eff effectively... Leanne's my boss. <laughs> I don't think we can finish this conference without saying an extraordinary round of, or giving an extraordinary round of thanks and applause to Nick Rushworth. Oh, I will. Yeah, yeah. There is a special card here that everybody has signed for you. <laughs> but... Uh, It's lovely to be in the bubble, but it's been such an, such an extraordinary success and way more than what we could have ever imagined, Nick, um, in the depths of COVID and we were constantly deferring the dates and rebooking this venue and trying to figure out were, were we ever going to do this and I think it's just an extraordinary success and, and a tribute to you and your persistence that you've worked with the Interpoint team and you've worked with the board to, to really put on an extraordinary meeting. It's, it's, I'd, I'd love these conferences most of all uh, because they always have the, the voice of people with lived experience of acquired brain injury, um, but we also get the highest level of um, science and research and 
um, community involvement and it's it, it's been absolutely brilliant. So thank you so much and, you know, you've, you've, it, it, it's all you. So thank you very, very much. Now, safe, safe travels and, as I said, I look forward to seeing as many of you as possible in Adelaide 2024. Thank you.